But actually, I, I was coming here for fighting. Right. I come here a lot to train. I train on in Pactum County with Santi Okay. Yeah, so we used to come out a lot for that. And then um, I, I was, it was a dry spell for a while. Right. Yeah, because I uh, finished fighting, so there was almost no reason. And then uh, my girlfriend started fighting. So I'm here just coming out here because she's fighting. And the gym, the, the gym out there in Pactum Tani, the Santi Anoy's gym is like, it's not like Fairtex or, you know, those nice, uh, you know, Falang training centers. Yeah, this thing is just straight up like hardcore, you know, dogs and pigs running around with like kicking mitts and yeah, old school. You, she goes on a run. When, it, when we used to train there, we used to go on our runs and we used to have to bring, now she has to bring a stick. We used to just pick up rocks. For the story, the, the dogs come out. When they come close, we just throw the rocks and they take off. Yeah. But she carries a stick, you know, so it's like, it's a hardcore gym, so you know I, I kind of don't like it out there. That's too much in the boonies. There's nothing to do. There's so what I did was I taken an opportunity to come back to Bangkok. Um, the true fitness here. Okay. Um, the manager is like a big fan, so he helps me out with that. Lets me work out there. So I get a, starting to get a workout in. She goes there. I go out there every so often just to see her, and I just get a room here and stay in Bangkok. Man. That old school sort of gym. Do you think? Do you think they're dying now? Do you think it's becoming think the, more like the West? I think the whole trend is changing throughout the whole world. You know, it's, it's becoming a, a business. Mm -hmm. Before fighting was a martial art. Fighting was about testing yourself. Was about learning the skill, being as the strongest person that you can be. But now it's about bringing in the business. And even the fighters, they fight different. You know, they fight to win. They fight to get sponsors. They fight to become famous. The gyms are doing the same thing. You know, they they have to make it. For lot friendly because their money's not going to be coming from the Thai people, their money's going to be coming from the, the foreigners that come in to like a vacation in Thailand and train. You know? So it's aircon, you know, a lot of a lot of Falangs won't go to clubs somewhere that doesn't have aircon, you know. Like, um, they had like last week had an American guy come into the gym and check it out, and he was like complaining the whole time, saying this is too dirty for me. It's too long. Yeah, well, one day and he, he never came back. So, you know, sad. I like Santian's gym because it's a uh, it's real about Muay Thai, man. There's no clubs, there's no strip joints around, there's nothing around the area but Muay Thai, man. If you go in anywhere, you're walking up the street, past the dogs, and go to the little, you know, those little stands they have to buy fruit or food, that's it, man. You got nothing. Yeah, so, you know, it's a it's a trend that's happening. You know, it's martial arts, it has become a sport. And I don't know if you can really call it a martial art anymore. It's more of a sport now, which is... Sad in a way, I, I, I'm hypocritical of that because I'm sad because the martial art aspect of the fighting world, the fighting aspect is what I really um, held on to and embraced it. But I'm happy in a way because it makes martial arts or MMA or any type of martial arts, Muay Thai, it makes it a bigger sport. It makes it more attractive to other people. When we, when, we, when I found the UFC 13, it was still a barbaric sport. You, when you got in the ring, you still really didn't know what was going to happen because it was like, that's crazy. Anything goes kind of thing. You know, they had it. They was called NHB then. Yeah? So, you know, it's it's something that I walked into. And the only reason why I fought was because I found it to be a place that I could test myself as a man and test my honor. So, you know, who knows if I was brought up in this day, maybe I'd be fighting for money. Maybe I wouldn't have been the same fighter that I was. Maybe I would have been just trying to win, get wins, trying to pick fighters that I thought I thought I could beat. Thought to pick fighters that I that I could beat that could bring me to the title match. You know, I mean, my whole what I always say is that I hear Conor McGregor saying stuff like, you know, I can kick his ass. I got no problem with him. You know, you know Ronda Rousey says no one can beat me. I can beat everyone in the world. I mean, for me, in my day, it's like, then why do you fight? That's what my our day would be like. That like the fighting was about picking opponents that you couldn't beat. You thought you couldn't beat. Sure. You know, like when I pick opponents, it was Mark Kerr, Randy Couture, Nargara, Keith Hearing when he just beat you know, Erickson. All my fights were for Fuchanchi. It was all picked because those are fighters that I didn't think I could beat, and I wanted to test my will and my heart. Yes. Yeah. So. And that's where the Yamato Damashi comes in, right? Yamato Damashi, yeah. That's where that spirit. The samurai spirit. The samurai spirit. Yeah. 
I, I was watching that Randy uh, uh, Couture fight, and it was, I, I was watching you elevate yourself from the floor, <laughs> kicking it, kind of reminding me that that was, that was crazy. You know, and then you got up with that right hand and ka ching, yeah. and then you arm barred him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was kind of unheard of trying to do that. Well, it was all about finding ways to, to take him out. Yeah. Whether I'm on my back, whether I'm, you know, and, and when I'm laying on my back trying to kick him up at him, I realize that I, there's not much damage that I can do. So what I do is stand up. I mean, you, if you watch that, watch that fight again. He was waiting for me to stand up, yeah. and he threw a right. But somehow, I guess I walk right through that right. Yeah. But he threw, he landed a right right onto me when I stood up. But right. It didn't phase me. Because he kind of collapsed when you, because you, you you caught him with the right as well, right? It was yeah. a, and I love the way when you came out, you just smashed him with that low roundhouse. Yeah. And he kind of buckled. Because yeah. like, a lot of people, you know, it's the, the tap. The distance, yeah. I'm always thinking, I've been yeah. confused yeah. about the tap because you've had a fight not to make Yeah, exactly. Friend, yeah, right? yeah. You do see, that that's, that's, you do a sport, that that's a sports part of it. Right. That's about being a sportsman. There's yeah. almost too much forgiveness sometimes. You know yeah. when you see two tie fighters and there's a lot of respect and they never end up, they never end up fighting. Uh -huh. And you get that feeling they just want to coast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, but it's you, you, you never did that. You were always no, in there, a hundred percent. Well, you know, I was, I was in there. For me, it was a test of my will. It was a test of my heart. It was a test of how I could fight with my honor, mm -hmm. and my honor would be giving everything I got, mm -hmm. and not, not finding a way out. You know, so for me, when I had an opponent, he wasn't a friend. He wasn't. He was some. He was a thing that was going to try and take me out. Mm -hmm. So you know. It, when I, when I have, uh, you know, I always never did want to see my opponent. I never did want to talk to him. I never did want to be friendly. You know, it was the, the next time I'm going to see you, I want to see you at the weigh-ins and across the ring. And then I'm going to try and hurt, I'm going to try and hurt you. And I'm looking at it like this guy is trying to hurt me, man. He's not trying to beat me. He's trying to hurt me. And the reason why I go out so aggressive as I did is because the best way to stop something from hurting you is to hurt them first so they're unable to hurt you. That was my mentality when I fought. Yeah. You never, you never believed you were going to die. It was more of a, a, a way to test your inner fears as opposed to really actually thinking. That well, you what happened was, you know, yeah, as, when you really look at the fight, you know, it's like it's very hard to die in the fight. Yeah. One, the human body is an incredible machine. Two, there's referees to stop the fight. You have rules. Yeah, uh, my, yeah, you have rules, and you have the referees, and you have the doctor stoppage. You know, so. To die in a fight, there's a chance, but there's a very small chance. But what I like to do, what I always did was I accepted death before going into the ring. You know, you know, as far as not tapping, you know, it wasn't like I was some tough dude that said, ah, oh, I'm not going to tap. No, it's, 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 think about it, okay? If you, if you accepted in your heart in that fight that you were going to die, you yeah. A broken arm is nothing. You're sure. accepting death sure. now. You're sure. accepting to die in the ring that day. So the getting choked out is nothing. So you know, if I'm getting choked out, if I get into a triangle by you no know, girl put me in a triangle, and I feel like I'm getting lightheaded, I'm accepting death. It's already accepted. And I'm not the no bullshit fighter saying, "Yeah, I'm okay. I'm willing to die in the fight." And when he gets in the ring, he taps out. It's, I really, in those three months of training, preparing for the fight, I was geared on planning. That this was going to be my last day, and I was going to give everything I got. So, you know, when I get my arm in an arm bar, if I get a choke, the reason why I didn't tap was not because I was tough, because I really walked the walk where I did accept in my heart that I was willing to die in the fight that day. So, in a way, it was almost like a kind of uh, an emotional kind of safety mechanism for you to be able to go beyond when you have that kind of attitude of. You know, do or die. Yeah, does, do you think it allows you to go that step further? And also, well, I know that you, mm -hmm. you know, you take that onto your everything you do in your life, don't you? Well, I, I feel that you know, taking it to that level was about creating that situation. The reason why I got into the ring not because it wasn't because I thought I was good. The reason why I got into the ring wasn't because I thought I could be a champion. The reason why I got into the ring was because I wanted to build myself as a band. And the reason why I had to build myself is because I knew in the future I was going to have a loved one or possibly a family okay. that I would have to take care of. And I wanted to be able to take care of them even at the verge of death, even to something as big as death. I didn't want to ever freak out in any situation. I wanted to always be 
level-headed and you control. can protect them. Yeah, so to accept death and going into the fight, you're at that level. When are you ever going to be... So, so if you have a family and there's a life in this situation, it, we're either guys with guns or you're in a car, it's burning, you got to get them out, but the car's going to explode and you're burning, the, the fire's hot. When you get into that situation, that's probably the only time in your life you're ever going to get into that situation. I saw fighting as an opportunity to put myself in that type, type, not exactly as it is, but that type of situation every single time I got in the ring. So every time, I, every single time I got in the ring, when I was planning to die, I was building myself as a man. So, so I feel more confident. So I had, what, 18 fights or 20 fights. I feel 20 times more confident now yeah. that when that day comes, if I have to protect or save somebody, one of my families or someone I care about, I believe I can be on the level, the level of head possible. It was almost like it was the, for you, it was the ultimate method to life proof yourself from any experience. Yes, yes. Yeah. And that's the reason why I don't even play at all, isn't it? The reason why I retired is because I thought it was done. The, after the Ego Vovachanchin fight, I felt like there was nothing else that could push me to more of an extreme besides that. Yeah, because yeah, the Ego fight literally, I think my body went as far as it probably could without dying. And not one moment in my in, in did I have any panic. Not one moment in the fight did I have any panic, did I have any fear or any doubt of not wanting to be there. You know, I was still focused and I kept a level head all the way through. So after that eager fight, I felt, you know, there's nothing more that fighting can teach me. Yeah. I wasn't after a belt. I wasn't after the money. I wasn't after the fame. I was after learning to be the strongest man I can. Yeah. And I thought that fighting, I, I plateaued in it. And I thought it was time to move on. That's the reason why... I decided to retire. The reason why I went and fought hearing after that was because I felt I owe the fans of one more fight. And that's what happened. Because yeah. Brian Rose always talks about that, you know, fa facing your fears, mm -hmm. you know, it, you know, because it's one of the things, uh, you know, even, even doing things like this, it's about facing a fear. If you're, if you're scared of something, you should run towards that fear, conquer it, and then move on. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what you... Your whole career yeah, was I, I'm not sure if you can ever conquer fear, yeah. but, but you can control it. Right. You'll always have fear, and it'll never be conquered. Yeah. When you, when every time I got into the ring, I was scared. Yeah. But the fear never controlled me; I controlled the fear. And when you can do that, the fear becomes a, a, a friend and, a, and, a, and a, something that helps you. You can, you can use, use it. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, it's not. See, I'm with the Amish isn't about have, not having fears. That was the is about having fears and dealing with them. Like you say, walk towards it and learning to to be able to still move on through the fear. Yeah. Yeah. What is it about the, I have to ask this, the Hawaiian uh, cultural mentality that, that, that makes them such good fighters? Because you know, yourself, your brother, BJ Penn, uh -huh. uh, <laughs> I, I watched a documentary on BJ Penn and he's, you know, he's not a big man. Really, but he's incredibly he has that confidence, that body language, the way the way he talks, the way he posts himself. What is it about Hawaiians that makes them so so much like that? Is it the culture? I mean, the lifestyle, the lifestyle that we lived, um, a lot of survival, especially you know me, my brother, BJ Pan, Barry Yoshida, all all of us are, are Asians, so we grew up smaller than all the Hawaiians. You know, so back in the day. You know, I mean, you also probably know this, but back in the day, the bigger man equaled the stronger man. Mm. As we know today, it's not actually true, but back in that day, that's what it was. You know, the Hawaiians would always come and steal and take our lunch money. And, you know, so, you know, you say Hawaii has a lot of hot blood. They have that, that energy for fighting, but that's the ones that turn to that different side. Yeah. Because yeah. when you're getting your money taken every day, I have a lot of friends that just gave their money every day. And they never developed that fire. So, you know, it's just funny because the situation that we get brought up in Hawaii is you're going to fall on one side. You're going to, you're not going to stand in the middle of the triangle. You're going to either fall on blue, right? one side and give all your money and be a passive person the rest of your life, or you're going to have to fight and you're going to become a person of fire. That's the people you're seeing coming up in the UFC and the fighting world. Yeah. So it happened, you know, it's, I guess because it's such a mixed melting pot of people. In Hawaii, you have the Filipinos and Koreans. So it's it's all blended into one. And then you got the big Samoans and the Hawaiians there. They're like huge. You know, they're like three, four times. Literally, I'm not exaggerating. Three, four times in my size. 
and they're coming up to you when you're like a high school kid or an intermediate school kid and they want to take your lunch money. And the best thing, the best thing is to give it to them, you know? I also feel the island, people that grew up in the islands, mm. the Guam kids, you know, um, Hawaii, Hawaiian kids, um, New Zealand kids, you know, the kids that are in islands, man, for some reason, they got that, that, that criminal you know, feeling of, you know, being native or I don't know what it is. Yeah, you know, a tropical thing. Tropical thing. Yeah. Right, is it the heat? I don't know. Like, <laughs> no, I don't know yeah. Is it? Yeah, it's it's just, that salt air, man. <laughs> yeah. Are you still involved with uh, the, the Fukushima and the, yes. the, the kind of humanitarian work that you're yes. doing in, in Japan? Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, the kind of humanitarian work that you're doing in, in Japan. Yeah, so the funny thing is uh, mixed martial arts, I feel like I, you know, like a car has done, has too much mileage. Right. I feel like I used up, I had a lot of mileage of fighting. I just, uh, I have no, no interest in, in fighting anymore. I have no interest in coaching, except my girlfriend. You know, the only reason why I'm even a part of any fighting aspect of, as far as not just being, I'm a, I'm a big fan. I watch every UFC, yeah. but you know, the only reason why I'm actually a part of the training aspect of it is because of other than that, my, my love is, you know, trying to do and help people in the North, North Japan. Yeah. So it's continuous trips. We're on a uh, mission 39 now. So, mm -hmm. So Mission 39 is probably going to be in December to an orphanage. And then Mission 40 is going to probably be uh, in January up north to, it's like a uh, slash winter Christmas mission. Yeah. Bring cakes and uh, bring gifts and heaters and cook for the people up north. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I find my joy in that. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, it's, I'm, not, I'm not a great humanitarian or I'm not like this awesome person. I'm, it's just my way of finding happiness. You know, Conor McGregor has finds happiness. Oh, say uh, Floyd Mayweather has finds happiness buying nice cars. I find happiness in, in seeing the smiles on people's faces that I think lasts longer. Do you, do you think a lot of the people, whether it's fighters or, or whoever, who have been through a certain amount of like tra you know not trauma, but maybe trouble in the past, or or they've been through a lot of struggle, they 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 enjoy that relief of, of doing things like that. And, and why do you think that is? Is it is it like a, a, a kind of a, a, a relief is it like the kind of yin and yang yeah you think, i never really thought about that but i think that's true yeah it's people who's been through struggles yeah. people who's been through hard times understand what it feels to help people or be helped yeah and then it, it, it opens up that avenue to make you realize how wonderful it feels to actually help you you know because when i one i went to prison lost my freedom the second thing that happened to me was that really is I went on the pilgrimage and I walked the pilgrimage, slept outside and, and pretty much, you know, I, I, I felt weird doing it because I felt like I got a house, I got a car, I got friends, but I cut all that off and I'm walking like a homeless person. I mean, starting to smell and I know what homeless people smell now because they sweat and they dry and they sweat and they dry without taking showers. So for me, man, when I did that, um, it opened my eyes because a bottle of water, man, and someone, a lady brought me a, a yeah. gave me a water or gave me a bag of bread. So, man, I just was yeah. like, man, thank you very much. And when the, it helped me understand that when the tsunami happened up in the north and the, the people lost everything, yeah. water, you know, canned goods, ramen, you know, that type of stuff. And so the pilgrimage opened up that idea to understand that, you know, how, how, what it means to people to have nothing. Yeah. And that opened up my vision of how wonderful it felt to help people. Even for yourself, probably. There's a, probably a lot of things in your life that you take for granted. That if you really realize how lucky you were, you'd be a much happier person. You know, like for me, when I used to, when I was, uh, before, you know, getting into bed, what's the only thing getting to bed? Okay, what time am I going to get up for work tomorrow? Oh, shit, this is late. I only got five hours of sleep. Or you're thinking about what happened that day. You get down in bed pretty much with no feeling lying down. Oh, God, it's sleep. When I was on the pilgrimage, at five in the evening when the temple was closed, I had to find a place to sleep. I had to walk and find somewhere to sleep. I had to find bus stops. I had to find maybe empty laundromats. I had to find corners with shelter. At least I wanted at least a square, I mean, a, a two wall shelter to, to shelter myself. You know, and it was it was a chore every day. And sometimes, even if you were to look at the at the place that I would sleep and say, "Holy shit, you sleeping there," but 
sometimes when you see that, I just look at it like a cozy place. So after going out for the pilgrimage, what happened to me after that was every time I even like a hotel or even my own bed, when, every time I get in that bed, I get this warm feeling of happiness, man. I'm so happy getting in bed and I got, uh, you know, the pilgrimage, if it rains, 70% of the places that you can sleep disappear. Even if the place that you picked out that night, if it starts raining in the middle of the night, you got to pack up and move somewhere else. Yeah. I also understand you make bracelets. Yeah, right here. It's like what I do now is another one of my loves now. Okay. So these are like precious stones. That, yeah, all, that, all yeah. precious stones, all real gems, some okay. different right. types. Where like, do the stones come from? Um, all over the world. So you either buy them in Japan or you find some in Hong Kong or China or... Yes, yeah, so it's all over. Like this is like the garden quartz, bloodstone, you know, the coal wood from Hawaii. This is a, like a Bangai bead, a temple bead from Japan on the pilgrimage that I do. So yeah. it's all different types of beads. It's, it's, a, it's a good because it's not only just a beautiful part of something to wear, it's um, also there's health properties, there's energy properties. Yeah, so that's what I do. Is that a little bit like the crystal sort of? Yeah, concept of yep. you know you wear on a certain area and you you, you get energy from the, the, uh, the chakra stuff or yeah or even just the the, the crystal quartz some um, positive energy master healer you know they have different types of properties for every stone yeah so that's what we do that's what I do is we me and my girlfriend do that we she helps me line it up they tell us you know what they want it for what's their you know the colors they like they like it flashy or it's quiet and we line something up and personally work with every customer yeah yeah but you still you still do the jiu-jitsu you still keeping up the, the ground um no <laughs> oh, i haven't put on the gi for years yeah, yeah so i'm going I'm, I'm to start to help her out but do you, do you miss it the, no the, not at all ground stuff? that's the thing i don't miss it at all really? and i guess a part of it is knowing that this ground technique just keeps going forward yeah and i feel like i've just missed the train and not interested in, you know, I know my personality, man. If I get back in there and I start rolling with people, I'm going to want to start getting up to date with everything. And, and you yeah. know, grappling is it's about putting more time into the, into the sparring. Put more time on the mat. And I don't know if I want to start taking away more time to be on the mat so often, as often as I probably would want to be to get better on the ground again. Right. And so I, I, I want to just put that side behind me and, you know, help people and give knowledge to seminars of stuff that I know. But as far as, you know, getting back to that level, you know, people entertained an idea about doing a grappling match with Randy Couture. Okay. You know, in the in the Metamorphs or something, you know, that kind of, that would, whew, if I had three months, I might actually get back into that just for that. Just, it'd be an interesting match. You know? Yeah. But other than that, I, I it, it, It's a bit like the chapters, you know, it's past, it's gone, it's gone through that process of yeah i feel like it's a stair in my life that i've climbed and i'm climbing up to higher stairs now yeah and it's back there and i don't want to get go back there because i got because when if i go back to that stair it's going to tamper me from getting higher up on the other stair yeah. and you and you mentioned about negativity how i do it negativity sure. yeah. i always believe that things that everything in life happens for a reason because that's how i do it negativity Whatever happens, we I always believe that. I really believe in you gotta believe that in your heart. You just can't say it. Because if something bad happens and you're just saying it, you won't feel it. But for me, I really believe it in my heart that everything that happens to you, good or bad, is for a reason. Miss a bus, you probably were meant to meet someone on the world on the road when you gotta walk, you know. So it, it karma. Thank karma, you. yeah. Karma. 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 Even that helps me a lot with looking over, you know, when you meet dicks on the street and stuff. I always feel like karma's gonna take care and karma probably can do ten times more than I can. Yeah. Slap him in the head or punch him in the face, you know, karma will probably hit him harder. Sure. Yeah, karma sure. karma's can hit harder than me, man. Yeah. So I, I yeah, I believe in karma. You, you talk quite openly about the uh, in Japan about the, the Yakuza. Mm -hmm. Um, we've got quite a few interesting stories. Yeah. I've seen them on the yeah. old cliffhangers on Instagram. Um <laughs> what, <laughs> what um can you, can you give us a Yakuza story? How, how did that come about? How did you meet them and, and, and what happened there? Well, you know, the Yakuza back in the day were actually came from the samurai. And so they have this code of honor that they live by. Mm. And what attracted them to me, I didn't get attracted to them. What attracted them to me was my fight style. And the way I spoke, the Yakuza Tamashi, 
they love them. They love their honor and that willing to die in the ring. They willing to die for your brothers. That's how they are. They'll stand and die for. They'll go to jail for ten years for a brother, mm-hmm. even if they didn't do anything. You know, so it's the honor and the, the loyalty that they have. That's what I encompass and what I express in my interviews. And they, that's how they took to me. So I had a lot of guys come to me for friendship. And I mean, it's like when you when you first befriend one of them, it's not like you're going to take them into your house and show them and do business with them and do and sell drugs with them or do whatever. You know, it's just pretty much just, hey, you got Yakuza guys out there. It's a part of Japan all over the world. I mean, in Japan, it's all over. Big companies, any big company, Coca-Cola, Johnson & Johnson, Pride, K1, Shuto, any big company has affiliates with Yakuza. I don't care what people tell you. They're bullshit if they say they have no Yakuza ties. If you're anything big in business, you have Yakuza ties. You cannot make it in society without Yakuza ties. I think that shocks a lot of people. Yeah, it will to, shock it, a lot of people. You know, to even today, right? Yeah, even today, people don't understand that. I mean, if people try to say, Shuto tries to say they're Yakuza free, they're not Yakuza free. They have the Sumiyoshi clan backing them up. I mean, every associate, if you go into Coca-Cola, there's no way Coca-Cola could make millions of dollars without having a, having a Yakuza connection. They all have Yakuza connections. So you, they're all over Japan. They're coming to be my friends. What I'm going to do? Tell them, fuck you, get out of here. I don't like Yakuza. You know, of course, hey, sure, let's be friends, you know. So we become friends. And you got 30% of them that live and die by honor. And you got 70% of the punks that try to act tough and be cool. Yeah. But, you know, I, I can, because I have that choice, I can choose which ones I just be friends with and say hi when I pass them. And which ones I take into as a family. And I've taken in a lot of them that would die for honor, you know. So, I mean, she meets them all. And she, sometimes we walk away and she's just like, holy shit, that's like one of the nicest guys I ever met. And they're like, you know, big Yakuza guys, you know. So, that's how it happened with me is they came to me and I just accepted. So, they kind of, they kind of wanted you to be like an affiliate in a way. As a, because at that point, you were becoming quite big and they... Do you think, in a way, that was that was what was happening? Well, more than affiliate, it was more that they respected me so much because of the way I was. It was something that did the, the name, code that they lived. The name came from the the track. The, the Yamato Damashiki name came from the fans, from the right. uh, one, one, one of the yeah. writers. Yeah. He mentioned it to me. Yeah, and so um, yeah, the, the they didn't want me to become affiliate with them. They wanted to just be a part of me. They respected me so much. That they just wanted to be a part of me. They wanted to hang out. They wanted to go to dinner. They wanted to tell all their other Yakuza friends that their friends were in Sinai. So that's the thing that I had is I never bowed down to them. I never had to, you know, do that, you know, he's my teacher. Oh, sorry. Okay. So no, it no, it was like, hey, what's up, dude? You yeah, know, it was right. kind of like that. You know, they were just happy to be on that relation with me. And then you have these fake ones that come and try to be my friends and fool me, mm-hmm. making me think that they're like family. And then I, I hold them like family, and then I find out they screw me over. And I've had incidents like that where I've beaten them up, which is a, a big no-no in Japan. And I'm, I'm lucky to be alive today because of that. I'm lucky to be alive only because I run my life the way I do with the Yamato Namashi cool with honor. Because if I beat up a Yakuza guy, and it was because I was mad, or it was because I was pissed off, or I didn't like the guy, or he came in when I was pissed off, and I was just in a bad mood, I'd be dead today. But... Whenever I had a problem with them, it was about them disturbing my honor, dishonoring me. But in a way, they recognize that also. So it, I guess it kind of it resonates with them as well. Yeah. Well, they came, well, when when it happened, for example, when I beat up, I was beating up a young guy in the park. He was the guy that I assigned to Kid Yamamoto. When I raised Kid Yamamoto, they wanted to open a gym. I said, "Okay, I'll let you use my name." They paid me ten thousand dollars to open with my name. And then I told them that all you, the other thing you have to do is you have to hire two of my fighters so they can live off fighting. So, okay, they hired Ryan Bow and Kid Yamamoto. And then from there, just Kid got famous. Kid got too big for his britches. These Yakuza thought they were like in big with Kid now. And they started going behind my back. I found out, made calls, told the guy I want to meet with him. He was scared. He avoided my calls, went to the gym. He was never at the gym. And funny, caught up with him. Caught with him at a for He was at a party. After kid won a fight, he went to a party. Went to the party, put him out of the party, and beat him up in the park. And when that happened, 
the Yakuza, like, if you beat up my little brother, I'm coming out. Hey, what the fuck's going on, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm fucking swearing on this. Like, it's okay to swear. Cool. Okay, okay. <laughs> we encourage it. Yeah. <laughs> so, you Some know, more. that's what, that's what you, I would come out, say, you beat up my brother. What, what's going on here, you know? Yeah. So that's what happened. They came out. And because I didn't do it because I was just being a punk or because I was angry, I was doing it because I was dishonored. They understood that. They understood that. Yeah, so the higher-ups came right. out, and when yeah. I told them what happened, what I said, happened? hey, wait a minute, stop. They came out, like, real aggressive at first. True. And some of my guys held them back. I said, no, don't hold them back. Let them come. And I said, you know what? Let me say something. And if you guys don't agree with me, whatever. Yeah. And they came, and I said, you know, hey, he dishonored me. This is what he did. So he did. He said, okay, but... You can't lay hands on our guys. That's our guys. And I said, hey, if you someone screws you up, screwed over you over, and you did 30% of what you really wanted to do, wouldn't you think that's being nice? And I said, yeah, but look at him. And he was bleeding. And, but he was still standing. He was still alive. I must have been beating up for like 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Like punching him, letting him drop him, bringing him back up, you know. And he looked over and I said, I said, 20 minutes. I said, he's still standing. He still can talk. And he looked at me, and the guy just was like, Phew, you're right, and changed his mold and started talking to me. Yeah. Yeah. And he asked me to not do anything more, and I said, I'm cool, man. I did my thing. I yeah. want him out of my life. He said, please, then leave it at that. And if he ever screws you over again, I'll kill him myself. So I was like, shoot. I just met up with that guy. And he re recalled that story. It was kind of funny, man. Yeah. Recall that story. And he said, yeah. He said, man, he told all these other Yakuza guys around us at the table. He told them that. Yeah, you know, he beat up AG, and I had to go get him. And then he told me that I only did 60% or 70%. Of, I only did 30% of what I wanted to do. And he said, shit, what could I do? He's right. Yeah. <laughs> it was kind of funny. We had a laugh about it. Yeah, but I, I, th I think it's not so much what you do, but it's why. right? They want to know why. And as long as they get that, that concept, you know, it's about honor again, that it kind of almost, as long as it validates it, and those rules are set and they're not crossed, which is guess what he's, they were saying. You know? Yeah, yeah. There's, right? a, there's a reason behind it and I'm not where it stepping over from. the line. Yeah. yeah. I'm doing what's fair and what I believe is right. I'm just wrong. checking your hands, and There's no little fingers missing. No, there. nothing, man. <laughs> You've been looking down at my fingers? No. The little there, fingers man. are still there. You know what that is, yeah? The Yakuza, back in the day, was you, you cut off a joint, yeah? So if you, if you, it's a, it's a way of apologizing. It's from the... the no, the, from here, so the here, oh, the last. If they, you see someone cut down here, there's two. There's two mistakes. Oh. And once they go on here, they got to start here, right. and then here. So they got two fingers made. They made a lot of mistakes. Yeah. So back in the day, they used to make people make the yakuza give fingers, yeah, but they don't do that anymore. Because I remember watching a documentary about a yakuza boss, mm -hmm. and he, he he made one of his guys do it because he answered the phone in the incorrect way. Ooh. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, okay. Nowadays, though, it's more about the guy self apologizing, yeah. showing his his regret and what he did. Yeah. That's what I want to do with you, and so I want to do a, a run and a bit of mafia action. No, okay. in, in we, can, we can meet some of the guys, man. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, for sure. I'm, I'm hitting you up on that, dude. You gotta, you already told me you're gonna take me down there, man. Okay, man. That's all I look forward to that. Hey, Anson, thank you. Man. Hey, thank you very much, man. Thank Appreciate you. that. Appreciate it. Anytime, let me know. <laughs>